to be. When we opened our doors in the 1960s, it was all very different. Then, most immigrants hailed from former British colonies and were comparably small in number. Manzor Mogul came to Britain from Uganda in 1972, when the Dulali Idi Amin expelled thousands of his Asian countrymen. Well, British society was not alien to me because we had grown up in institutions in Uganda which were British all the time. Uganda was a British protectorate, a colony, for a long time. And all the institutions, financial, governmental, political, social, they were all modelled on the British way of life. And Asians had respect for British institutions. Many of the new Muslim immigrants have not arrived here from former British colonies. They settle knowing little about Britain and its values, and many of them bring with them an Islamic philosophy that doesn't sit easily with what we know as Western secular democracy. The most obvious problem, I suppose, is the apparent discomfort with which Islam views homosexuality. This Muslim is gay. He lived in a North African Islamic country until the homophobic attitude prevalent there drove him to flee to Britain. I will never forget this day I witnessed a big crowd stolen two gay people on the street. And they hit one of them very badly on the head. And in spite of the fact that he was bleeding and, you know, they continued to stone him and to chase him up. He wouldn't wish to be a homosexual where he comes from, would you? He tried to keep his sexuality secret, but ultimately he couldn't keep it concealed from everyone. Someone followed me, he called me names, he beat me up and he produced a gun. He, he, he started intimidating me with a gun. I was living in fear afterwards. He even tried to turn straight, praying God to turn me straight. But, so. I had to leave my family and I had to leave my job. It wasn't an easy decision to take. Being gay and a Muslim is also a bit of a problem in Britain. But there are differences in the tone of approach to homosexuality between the strains of Islam here. There are the views of those from the Indian subcontinent, for example. Islam is against homosexuality. There's no doubt about it. It will not promote, it will not condone, it will not encourage. And yet, it will not go out of its way in a non-Muslim land to punish practicing homosexuals. Now how would a, a gay Muslim be treated then by his community and by you? A gay Muslim would be tolerated because the person is gay. But if he or she went around openly propagating and openly admitting to their homosexuality, then those people would be frowned at and would be looked down frowned upon. Frowned at? Is that the extent of the...? There's nothing more can be done. They'd be frowned at and uh, they would become perhaps social outcasts in the society. However, there are worse things than being a social outcast. These days, many immigrants bring with them a version of Islam that takes a somewhat more rigorous approach to gays. Dr. Azam Tamimi is one of them. He's a Palestinian Muslim who now lives in Britain, and his views on homosexuality are totally at odds with our liberal notions. You see, the danger about homosexuality, and that is what people in the West will realize if they haven't realized yet, is that there is a false claim that they are homosexuals by nature and that is used to promote this and spread it. Now they are the, they are the, uh, the abnormal condition and they want everybody else to become like them so that they are not abnormal anymore. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. Uh, yes. Homosexuals don't want everyone to be homosexual. Of course. Uh, they, 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 what is rubbish? Who told you that? 
they they'd want this to be part of the education. They'd want this to be part of. They want to be seen as being equal. That's all. Well, a person that commits an offence is definitely not equal. Of course, in Britain, homosexuality is no longer an offence. But there's something even more fundamental to our Western idea of freedom, which all strains of Islam find unacceptable: freedom to choose your own religion. The Islamic idea of apostasy is at odds with our rather lily-livered notion of freedom of conscience. The idea that we can stop believing in what we once believed. Muslim societies take a dim view of renouncing one's faith. It's seen as treason, and in some countries, is punishable by death. Even here, apostasy excites an angry response in many Muslims. This British Muslim decided to convert to Christianity. She wanted her family to come to her baptism. Instead, her father brought what she thought was a lynch mob to her home. I really wanted to make a public declaration. Um, straight away, my dad got very angry and very uh, upset that you know his daughter was was a Christian. Um, was telling everybody, and so he turned up at my house. And there was 50 guys coming towards my door. I recognised him, obviously. I recognised some of the others from the Muslim community. And then, as we got closer to the house, they were starting to shout things: "Traitor! We're going to kill you!" And then I, I basically ran upstairs and、um, hid in my, in my bedroom, and I was praying that God would protect me. This woman didn't, in the end, come to any physical harm, though the ordeal terrified her. Doctor Tamimi doesn't condone lawlessness, but his view of apostasy is in direct opposition with the principles that go to make up our liberal democracy. If you asked a hundred British Christians if it was okay for one of their member to renounce a religion and to criticise it uh, uh, volubly, ninety-nine percent would say yes, of course, that's right. And that's what our government allows us to do. Well, Muslims will not say that. But that's what I'm getting at. If in Christian societies it is no longer、uh, offensive for people to rubbish their religion, that doesn't apply to Islam and the Muslims. And in an Islamic society? No, in an Islamic society, of course, he will be seen as、uh, someone who has uh, uh, committed treason, an act of treason. And what would happen? Wouldn't be nice, would it? Well, it depends on.、Uh, The assessment of that offence—it's considered an offence. If it is something personal, and that's his choice, and, and then he'll mind his own business. Nobody Why should he mind his own business? Why shouldn't he exercise freedom of speech? That's what I'm getting at. That there are things inherent in Islam which are absolutely incompatible with freedom of speech. You see, the problem is that there are individuals in the world today who have gone to such an extreme. In secularizing themselves and secularizing their thinking, that、uh, they think they can say whatever they like, wherever they wh whenever、uh, they happen, to,、uh, whenever they like, wherever they happen to be, and that's a false notion because there are things you cannot say even in Britain. And if the government has its way, one of those things will soon be to limit our freedom to criticize the Islamic religion. I disagree fundamentally with what Dr. Tamimi is saying, but I do support his right to say what he likes. This is why I also support the right of the British National Party leader to say that he dislikes Islam. The recent case against him is, I reckon, an affront to the notion of freedom of speech. It's an absolute fundamental of this country, and there's war memorials up and down this land. Uh, with the names of people on, who fought for the rights of people to say things, whatever they want to say,、uh, and so I think that any law which restricts that freedom of speech is politically extraordinarily dangerous, because it's a very slippery slope towards a totalitarian society. And it's the ideology of multiculturalism which has pushed us down that slope. For the past 40 years, we have tried to accommodate the diverse cultures and beliefs that immigration has brought into Britain. But some of those beliefs were rather more astringent and challenging 
we may have bargained for.